It's not going to show it. It's just a screen. Oh, okay. Yeah, just, just the screen is showing. Okay. It's just one Já, ég ætla bara að fara að byrja. Velkomin í vísindaportið. Ég ætla að bara strax að skipta yfir á ensku, þegar þess að enn dagsins verið að halda ensku. So welcome to the lunch lecture and welcome Timothy Hleniak, who is our guest today, who just started teaching here with us at the University Center. So you will tell us a lot about migration to the Nordic countries and some challenges that those countries have been facing. So please go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I've given a number of lunchtime talks in my career and I'm always, it's always a dilemma of do I eat before and then I'm sleepy during the talk or do I go hungry and eat afterwards and I've never been able to solve that. Anyway, um, yeah, the title of my talk, uh, I said, is the very welcome migration and diversity in the Nordic countries. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my organization, Nordregio, the Nordic Center for Spatial Development and some of the research that we do on migration and integration. I'll talk a bit about some of the key um, trends and policy issues regarding migration in the Nordic region, the foreign populations or foreign origin populations, and then some of the policy responses that uh, the Nordic countries are, are undertaking. So this is uh, Nordregio, the Nordic Center for Spatial Development. We are uh, an institution of about 50 people, and we do uh, policy-oriented research uh, for, uh, we're an institution under the Nordic Council of Ministers, and the Nordic Council of Ministers is the intergovernmental body that um, uh, promotes cooperation among the Nordic countries and tries to find common solutions. Um, yeah, and this is our lovely office uh, in, on an island called Shepsholm in the middle of, of Stockholm. Uh, it used to be uh, the, the headquarters of the Swedish Naval Academy. Um, but at some point they realized the, the Swedish Naval Academy was a little bit too close to the Royal Palace. And so they moved it uh, somewhere else. Um, we do research in different areas. You can see some of the here, demography, socioeconomic analysis. Uh, we do a lot of work on sustainable development, green growth, and then we have a focus because of where we are on the Arctic. And I myself do a fair bit of work on um, the Arctic as well. The ge geographic focus, we obviously work a lot in the Nordic countries, but we also have quite a bit uh, on uh, Europe, uh, uh, we have a number of European funded projects and collaborate with others in Europe, trying to bring a, a Nordic element or Nordic angle to those. Um, and obviously the Arctic, and then in the last five or six years, we've also done a lot of research on the, the Baltic Sea region and kind of maritime spatial planning and issues like that. So I'm just showing some examples of the, some of the research that we've done on on migration integration, um, integrating migrants into the Nordic labor markets. Um, this one, this one's more country by country. This is topic by topic. Uh, integration of refugees, from migrants to workers, which is something that I, I wrote looking at kind of uh, migration trends. And I'll show some of those in, in a moment. Um, this might have been taken nearby, this picture. Um, so we also did some case studies looking at how uh, local communities actually go about this process of integrating migrants into the, the labor markets. Um, and, I'll, and we did one of the case studies actually here in East of Fjord a few years ago, and I'll talk a bit about that. 
um, policies to speed up uh, refugees. And re refugees, the, and I'll mention this in a moment, uh, was a rather large group in 2014, 2015 into the Nordic countries. And people who come in as refugees tend to have take a lot longer to integrate into the labor market than others. So there's a special focus on on refugees. Uh, we put out a publication every other year called the State of the Nordic Region, and I actually have just one copy of the most recent one that came out a couple of weeks ago. And I'm going to donate this to the library when we're done. Um, so we did a, a special issue on, or, uh, sorry, we did the publication two years ago, and um, because of the, the importance of issues of, of immigration and integration, we did a, a special a special edition that kind of pulled out some of the main topics. Um, and then this is the one, yeah, from this year, and I wrote this chapter, what was it, chapter three on migration and mobility in the Nordic countries. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the findings from that um, publication. So some of the key research and policy issues regarding migration in the Nordic region. And this is a quote from uh, that special edition that I showed. Managing migration is one of the most complex challenges for politicians and societies in our time. Um, and I don't know if you can tell by my accent, but I'm from the United States, and I think some of the others are here from the United States. And I show two symbols of immigration into the United States. Of course, the Statue of Liberty, welcoming, you know, give us your, your tired and your poor. And then I show a picture of the wall. And this fellow, I don't know if you know this fellow, Stephen Miller. He's a senior advisor to the current U.S. president. And of course, the U current U.S. president, um, you could say, got voted into office on a very anti-immigrant um, platform. I mean, he came down talking about Mexicans being you know, drug addicts and rapists and things like that. And, you know, got voted into office because a lot of people you know, agree with him um, and support it. This guy, um, Stephen Miller, like I said, is a senior advisor. So any policy you hear in the United States about building the wall, banning people from Muslim countries, requiring refugees to have their own health insurance and things like that, it probably comes from this guy. Um, he's been speaking in the, uh, Trump's ear for quite some time. Um, so, you know, uh, migration policy in the United States, I'll show that in a second, has kind of swung back and forth between being welcoming and not welcoming. Um, and I, I would argue, obviously, that it's, it's, it's swung much more back towards being quite restrictive. Um, here I show the, for, the total foreign-born and the percent foreign-born over time, um, yeah, the yellow one shows the percent. So here, this is the period of, of the great migration from the Nordic countries, including Iceland, from Europe, to the United States in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and then you can see there was various restrictions put on my immigration to the United States. Um, and the percent foreign born dropped to a low of about, about 4% in the 1970s. Again, kind of a, a different shifts in, in policies over time. And now the percent foreign born is, has gone up and it's rivaling um, the percent back during the, the great migration. And I, and I think I would argue that this, this rise, and I mean, this is when I was a, a child, I mean, you know, growing up in, in the United States at that time, I mean, you, the presence of, of foreign born people was minimal. You didn't have that many, you didn't see foreign restaurants and things like that. And I think this rise is what's causing anxiety among a lot of people in the United States. Um, they want to restrict it, they want to take back their country, etc. So, and, and this is, a, I'm, I'm talking about a country that is obviously was founded really on immigration. I mean, that's aside from some Native Americans. I mean, it's been a, a, a country of immigration for its entire, entire history. And this shows the, sorry, I guess that didn't show up, the percent change in the foreign born by county over a, a 30 year period. So that 100 means that the, the foreign born population has doubled. 
And so you, you, know, you see most of the country has actually gone up quite a bit. And so it's a bit shocking for these small homogeneous counties in different places to all of a sudden have foreigners, to have you know, non-native English speakers in school. So it's a bit, um, it's a new reality um, and it's hard for some people to deal with. Just briefly, what's gone on um, over time. I mean, Ellis Island opened up in the late 1800s um, and about 40% of, of Americans um, can trace um, back to a relative who passed through Ellis Island. Um, and then at some point we became a little bit more re, uh, restrictive. We started to deny anarchists, other political extremists. Um, and then here's where it started to go down. We, we had a policy uh, to limit the, the number of people from any country to 3% of the population that was already in that country. And what basically what this did was reduce immigration from Italy uh, and other places in Southern Europe, um, and then kind of have favored people from Northern Europe, so Nordic countries and elsewhere. And then this was maybe our, our first, I shouldn't say mistake, but I'm going to talk about unintended consequences of migration policy. And this is probably one of our first ones. Okay, um, we uh, um, we had a shortage of men fighting in, in the war, so we said, okay, uh, we asked a number of uh, Mexican workers to come to the country temporarily. And there's nothing as permanent as a temporary migrant. Um, and some of these people are still here, or their descendants years later, because they didn't want to go back at the end of this period. Um, yeah, and so 1965, we, we eliminated the, the national quotas at that time. Um, and, and what basically what this, and, and then we, we changed the policy to be less labor, more um, allowing uh, family members of citizens to come to the country. And basically what this did was had two effects. It increased the total number of people coming to the United States and it, it also um, changed the geographic origin. So we had less people from Europe, more people coming from, from Asia. And then we had, uh, um, and then we had a, a, a something called IRCA, a reform where basically at that time we had, I don't know, five or six million um, undocumented or illegal migrants, whatever you want to call them. And we said, okay, we're going to put up barriers to new migrants, but we're going to legalize the ones that are already here. So we legalized some 3 million migrants, uh, or something like that. Um, we're going to legalize the ones that are already here. So we legalized some 3 million migrants, uh, or something like that, um, to requiring people to show their immigration status before being issued driver's licenses and things like that. And also, uh, we're, we're requiring a lot of employers to be able to to check on immigration status, um, and then this one under under President Obama, what was called the the Dreamers Act. So we had a, a large number, I don't know the number, a couple million um, children who were brought to the United States Ill, basically illegally by their parents, um, and what basically what this act says is that um, okay. You're here illegally, but you didn't do it on your own will. Um, we will allow you to stay in the country um, uh, as long as you haven't committed crimes and things like that. Um, and this was the, the problem with this is that it was an executive action. So it was something done by the president. It wasn't some uh, policy that was passed through Congress. Um, and Trump is trying to undo this. And then obviously what that we've swung back much more towards um, uh, restricting migration under the current president. Um, so one question is why, why, and now I'm switching back to the Nordic countries, um, how, you know, do the Nordic countries, they're, they're aging in, in, in uh, well, yeah, they're, they're basically aging. So do, we, does the, do the Nordic countries need migrants? And basically what we're showing here is the, the the bars in the middle show the present population? Then, if we allow migrants, you can you can um, not reverse aging, but you can certainly uh, um, uh, 
help with the aging aging issue. But the problem is you need to quickly integrate people into the labor markets. So I show here, yeah, this shows the, uh, for Iceland, the population born in Iceland, you can see if you have a, a migrant population, they tend to be much, they have a much younger profile than the native population. And so they can, um, yeah, 13 and percent of the population is foreign born. Um, but in these ages, 26 to 37, it's about a quarter of the pe people in Iceland are foreign born. So they can, it's a mu much more mobile population. Um, and if you, if we switch to the regional level, um, basically what this shows is three different types of regions in the Nordic countries. Um, those that are in green are regions that would have grown over this period, even without migration. Okay. And the ones in red show those regions that would have, that would have declined even if they had international migration. But the interesting ones are those in yellow. And these are places that grew only because they had international migration. So you can see in Iceland, much of Southern Iceland, the population would have declined if it hadn't been for uh, Polish and other, other workers that have come to the, to the country. But one of the, the, the dilemmas is that, and it shows here the employment rates of natives foreign born and then those born outside of the EU 28. And you can see the kind of natives typically have the highest employment rate followed by foreign born, followed by those born outside the EU 28. Um, and a lot of these people come uh, as different labor migrants, but also as a lot of these come as, as refugees. So it's, it's the challenge of getting these people um, employment rates at the same, same levels. Um, that's, that's the biggest policy challenge. So some of the recent um, migration trends, uh, this is the, pers well, this is net migration into the Nordic region over the last 20 or years or so. And you can see the general upward trend. I mean, Sweden in 2014, 2015, um, a lot of these people came as refugees or asylum seekers, but they came under other statuses as well. The general upward and what, yeah, so let me skip. Yeah, yeah, so basically what this is showing is, is the difference between natural increase. That's the number, the difference between the number of births and the number of deaths and net migration. So over the last uh, recent decades or maybe a dec decade and a half, most of the population increase into the Nordic countries is because of immigration. It's not because of having more births and deaths. And so this obviously has resulted in a much more diverse country countries. And I can show this for Iceland. Um, this is the, the number of births over the number of deaths, and the red shows migration. And you can see here Iceland is kind of interesting because we have the big boom in the early 2000s, the drop after the financial crisis, but that picked up rather quickly. Um, the financial crisis didn't last all that long. And so Iceland, as many of you know here, um, has, been, has <coughs> had a, a large migration over the last years. And, and the, the other trend that's going on, this shows migration into the Nordic countries in 1990. And you can see here in 1990, uh, a lot of, much of the migration into the Nordic countries was from another Nordic country. So between Sweden and Denmark and Norway, some from Germany, UK, US, um, but you go forward to the 2000s and you're starting to see the first, you know, the, um, labor migrants from, from Poland, you're starting to see the first wave of, of refugees from Iraq, and then you go to the 2010s, and now we're seeing much more, uh, a, a much, uh, much more diverse group of sending countries. And a lot of these, obviously these, most of these are people coming from, uh, or coming in as refugees or asylum seekers. So there's been a shift in the, the countries of origin uh, and this is the number of asylum seekers per month. And this is about the period when I came moved to Sweden and I was given this task of analyzing migration. And I think, I think at that time, a lot of people, certainly in Sweden and the other countries, didn't really, it, it, they were a bit slow to grasp what was going on. I mean, the, the numbers were so, were so large at that time. Um, and the thing to focus on here 
this is the number of first resident permits in Sweden by reason, and the one here in orange, or I guess it's yellow, I mean, you can see as a percent of total migration, the total number of first permits is going up. So more and more people are coming in as refugees or asylum seekers. Um, yeah, there's other people coming in as family members and for work, but that's the, lar the, the largest increase category is those coming in as refugees or asylum seekers. Same situation in Norway, this orange, I mean, that's been going up. Um, yeah, same situation in Finland, the blue bars, a lot of people coming there. So, the, so that was a, a talk about the flows of migrants and refugees. So the foreign populations in all of the Nordic countries has gone up uh, dramatically over the last 30 or so years. It's a little bit hard to see, but certainly in Iceland, it's gone up. I mean, Sweden, the foreign population is is um, almost almost two million. So, uh, you know, contrast this with what I was saying earlier about the United States and the increase in the foreign born um, and the reaction of, of um, uh, you know politicians and the government. And so, this shows the share of the foreign foreign born populations. And this, you can see in, in all of the Nordic countries, it's gone up rather dramatically over the last third or so years. Um, Sweden actually has a higher percent foreign born than the United States does now. Um, so this is, you know, like I said, the United States is a country that was kind of founded on immigration. Sweden certainly was not. Um, and so you have this increase. And even in Iceland, you see this rather large, and now it's 15%. Um, foreign-born, even a country like Finland, they had one or two percent foreign-born here and now has about seven percent. So that's, uh, you know, for a, a country that was that homogeneous that recently, that's quite quite an increase. Um, yeah, and so I, I compare this to other countries. You can see here Sweden down here in the United States, a um, lot percent foreign-born. So Sweden, you know, you compare the Nordic countries to some of the other countries, UK, Germany, places that have long been receiving um, foreign-born populations. And the one thing about the Nordic countries is that they don't define a person of foreign origin the same. It makes it a bit of a challenge, but uh, you can see for Iceland, for any of these countries that the people born abroad, or I mean, the, the, the dark colors, the big one is, is those like, somebody born in Iceland to two Icelandic parents. But you can see the others are people born abroad who come here, people born here, but to foreign born parents. And if you see the, the same trend, I mean, this is Norway, they kind of increase. I mean, these are people who are, oh, what are they? Four Norwegian, Norwegian born to two Norwegian parents to four Norwegian grandparents, okay? Um, and then these are kind of all the other different categories. So these are people who are just, you know, Norwegian as long as you can go back. I mean, this, it, it's kind of the same trend here. Um, this is for Sweden. Um, like I said, they define these differently, which causes problems. Finland. Yeah, Denmark defines these by ancestry. So these are people of Danish origin immigrants and then their descendants. So you can just see the, the kind of increase as a percent of the population in these countries, you know, foreign citizens, let's skip that. And so what you're seeing, and, and, and again, think back to the chart that I showed, or the map that I showed earlier about um, the increases in the foreign born population by county in the United States, this is kind of the equivalent. So this shows the percent, the share of foreign born in 95, 2005 and 2015, you can see them get, it kind of gets darker and darker. And so it's the same, same trend of, um, you know, increasing numbers of, of foreign born um, in places, you know, Northern Norway, Sweden, and Finland, I mean, places that just probably never had a for, foreign born person. And now there's um, a sizable number. Yeah, and this shows the change, the percent change and it's, it's almost every municipality in the Nordic region has an increase in the number of foreign born. There's just some places in Finland where it's actually gone down. And by place of birth, this shows for those people from 
I guess the former Soviet Union, large numbers, of course, in, in, uh, uh, in Finland, southern Finland, um, the number of Filipinos, Thai, and Vietnamese, which I you certainly have here in, in Iceland, um, but this one is for, now here's the Polish born. So most of these are people obviously coming in as labor migrants, and of course the large number up there in, well, up here in Iceland. And so this map uh, takes a minute to figure out what this, what this is, but this, this shows the, the largest minority group in each municipality in the Nordic region. And I'll just highlight a couple. Um, uh, th those in yellow are those people who were born in one of the EU accession countries, so the 10 countries of Eastern Europe. And most of these are Polish born. And you can see in Iceland, on almost every municipality, it's somebody born either in Poland or in some cases, Lithuania. I, mean, I know way up at the top of Norway, um, Lithuanians make up about 10% of the population. Um, and working mostly in the fishing industry. Those in blue are, are people born in one of the former, born in the former Soviet Union, Russia, Estonia, Ukraine. Um, but those in red are those, and we lumped all of the, the major refugee sending countries, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Iraq, etc. So here in southern Sweden, people from those countries are making up five or 10% or more of the population. So that's a rather sizable number in some of these municipalities. And this is in the state of Nordic region, if you want to read more. So some of the policy responses, um, and again, to contrast this with the United States, we have you know, groups that are welcoming to immigrants who like the diversity <coughs> are trying to um, uh, help these people uh, integrate into, into U.S. society. I mean, this has been going on, like I said, for decades. So you have this certainly in the Nordic countries. And I showed some examples earlier of um, work that we've done at, at the, the Nordic Regio, the Nordic Council of Ministers, of, and, and there's all sorts of policies to try and speed up the integration of these people. Um, and part of this is because, I mean, the Nordic countries have high levels of employment. This is what kind of keeps the welfare state going, and especially of, of, of women as well, I mean, compared to other countries. But at the same time, there's been the rise of anti-immigration parties. Um, and, and they've gained between 13 and 21 percent of seats in the parliament. There was an election in Sweden a year and a half ago, and it took, I think, four months to actually seat the government because we had to incorporate the views of the Sweden Democrats, the kind of populist anti-immigrant party there, who are now, I think they made up about 19% uh, of the, of the um, seats. And then there's also been efforts to stem or control um, the you know, border controls across, I'll show the Orson Bridge here. I mean, every time I take the train, I have to show my ID there. Uh, and then there's also been external all this agreement between the EU and Turkey to stem the flows. So we did a few years ago some case studies and these were, uh, we went in and, and this, these were primarily focused on rural areas. Um, and so we went to different places and talked to, talked to Runer when we were here and talked to others. Um, about how, you know, the process of integrating immigrants. And like I said, the focus was really on rural areas. There's kind of a separate set of issues in, in urban areas. And so these are the, the six areas we went to, and I'll just highlight a few things. So this is um, Pukkaleiden, a little community in, well, that's right, yeah, over there in, in, um, in Finland. Um, and this is primarily a destination for refugees. Um, and there's a resettlement center. And this is us, uh, yeah, it, it's the Finnish forest, okay? So they make coffins. So they, there was a coffin making factory there that we went and visited this, this fellow, um, yeah, Syrian family who were placed there. Um, Northern Sweden, um, uh, Jampland is a place. And typically, there was always this a person like this, an integration coordinator. 
And so, you know, people come to these countries, especially as refugees, they have no personal ties, they don't have any um, uh, professional ties. And so this person kind of for a while uh, takes that place. And, and it's, it was usually a she um, would say, okay, here's the refugee family. And, the, and she kind of pairs them up with employers and, and takes care of a lot of other, uh, other needs so they can become uh, integrated quicker. Um, and then, of course, we were here at the East of Fjorder a couple of years ago. Obviously, a lot less snow than um, there is now. Um, and some of this you probably know. I think this is in Sudari. Um, obviously, predominantly Polish women working in the fish factory. This is here East of Fjorder. Um, yeah, and we did the same in, in, in Norway. Went went to Buda and a, a little municipality called Heroi, where a lot of the, the, this fellow was a tailor from, I think he's from Syria, and he was there undergoing the, the I think it was a two-year integration program that a lot of refugees um, undergo, uh, you know, kind of intense language training, training in kind of skills, how to look for a job. Um, and this is, could be here in Asif, well, maybe not Sam, but, we asked the, the, the fellow or the sorry, it's a woman who was the head of um, human resources. And she said, we asked how they were recruited. And she said, we don't recruit. I hire one Polish worker and 10 more show up at the door at the same time. So I, we haven't recruited in 10, 10 years, um, she said. So some of the, the observations from these case studies um, and the Nordic countries, or the languages of the Nordic countries are not spoken much outside of the Nordic countries. There's not this colonial heritage where people show up knowing English or, or French or something. So language is, is quite important, uh, but people need time to learn. Um, housing, I mean, there's always or often a mismatch between um, the supply of housing in uh, uh, these rural areas, and we talked to the former mayor of, of, of East of Fjorder, and he mentioned that, I mean, maybe you all know this. Um, uh, the issue of validation of skills, and what this means is, um, you know, people come from, uh, especially as refugees, from a, a quite different educational systems, and how to, you know, I, I was a doctor in Syria, but how do I prove I was a doctor, and what does that mean in Sweden or Norway or, or another country? Um, yeah, like I said, this integration coordinator was somebody we found who was quite important in this whole process. Um, this was a study done by the OECD a couple of years ago uh, that looked at integration, indicators of integration across the OECD countries. And um, they, group, they grouped the countries into different groups. And what they said is the Nordic countries are... Uh, ones with large numbers of recent and humanitarian immigrants. People have come rather recently, um, and they, like I said, they, they struggle to integrate. It takes a long time if they do it at all. Most of the Nordic countries do have well-established integration policies. Um, almost everyone has uh, this, this uh, integration period where people learn the language. And it varies by length and other things. But they also, uh, it was noted that immigrants are overrepresented at both ends of the education spectrum. So a lot of highly skilled immigrants, also a lot of um, lower skilled immigrants. And the employment rates, um, high, on, partly because the Nordic countries have high employment rates, it's hard to match um, some of those. Um, so I highlight the difference. Uh, so migrants, like I said, tend to be less um, have lower, so there's large numbers of recent migrants. Um, yeah, and Sweden has the largest number, largest share of humanitarian migrants, but there's, there's this issue of long-term unemployment um, compared to other countries. So to kind of conclude, I show the cover of this, this book by a demographer in the United States. He's been tracking migrants for uh, quite some time, and he wrote this book, or he updated this book recently called The Diversity Explosion. And he looks at, um, uh, you know, migrants and how they fared in the United States, where they live, uh, how they work, and uh, 
in, in you know, he's, he's showing it's a, it's a challenge for a country that was basically founded on immigration and has a long history, and it's um, so it's not easy. Uh, migration into the Nordic countries um, because of the stocks of migrants you have here. I mean, the Nordic countries are known as a destination. Um, it's it's likely to continue. Um, when I've looked at did another study looking, and this is kind of mechanical, but looking at population projections and all the Nordic countries project that migration will continue. Um, there's a lot of unintended consequences of migration policy, and I, I point the example of, of the United States. I mean, there's unintended consequences for any social policy, but migration, I think, more so partly because you have all these exogenous factors going on. Um, integration will uh, remain a challenge, obviously, in, in spite of having well-established policies and programs in place, and Sweden is certainly grappling with this because of the sheer number of people that it took in. Um, and the conclusion is there's no single policy that, that it's, it's kind of a combination depending on who you're trying to inter integrate. Um, you know, they, are, is education act or labor market policies? I mean, that's some of the studies that we sh I showed earlier um, came to these conclusions. So there's not one silver bullet to help integrate people. So all in there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Timothy, for the presentation. I'll follow up with questions or remarks. No. Oh, Claire. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, good. Thank you for I was just going to ask about um, the, the, the thorny issue of multiculturalism and you touched on integration. Uh -huh. I know in the UK, there's been a shift away from policy that uh, um, highlights other communities' languages mm -hmm. towards English-only publications in government, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if that's the case in the US or in Nordic countries, but that seems to answer the uh, concerns of some of the electorate. Yeah, no, I think certainly in the U.S. that yeah, I mean, we if you go back to the early 1900s, it was more assimilation. I mean, you you dropped your native language, you changed your name, you learned English, you became you know an American. Um, but certainly, I think over the last maybe 30 or 40 years, it has gone towards more of this multicultural. Um, you know, we have international nights at school where we kind of play up the, you know, your, your foreign origins and so it's, it's something to be proud of and you learn English, but you can maintain your native language. I know, I know certainly in Sweden, that's this, it's, I think the same. I mean, children have a right to some instruction in their native language. Um, so I think it, it has shifted more towards, towards that. Mm -hmm. Do you have a feeling that the social multiculturalism we're including social events. Do you feel that this has arrived at all at the policy level and at the regulation level? That it's not just that we're moving away from immigration being a struggle to just accepting it and you know yeah, I it to an advantage rather than Yeah, no, I think certainly in Sweden I think it's it's gone towards that. I mean for, for for most people, it's yes. We're we're kind of happy that there's. Okay, I'm not a Swede, but whatever. But yeah, no. I think on for most of the population, it's great to have this, you know, diversity of, of people and stuff. And so. So do you think there's more focus now on improving integration than reducing immigration? I think I think both are taking place. I mean, there there are certainly efforts to to reduce the number of migrants, and and it it very it's it's a bit of a challenge. It's, it, it varies among Nordic countries. Some were a bit more restrictive than others, but yeah, they're trying to restrict, but at the same time trying to integrate the uh, those who are who are already there. And and there's like I said, there's these integration programs. I think there's a lot of money being put into it, and so they're they're def I mean, they need to integrate these people and when we say integration that that's multifaceted but the the primary focus is getting people into the labor market um, so especially 
especially women, because there's big differences between male and female employment rates. And you, you will get like that one family I showed earlier in Pukalaid. I mean, um, it was, they were from Syria. It was a mother, a father, and eight boys. And so I don't know if the mother's ever going to work, but yeah. You, uh, um, so you showed before the uh, different types of, of, of immigrants, and one was um, students uh, or, or coming for education. Yeah. If I if I could read yeah. correctly, there was a huge increase in Norway in that respect. Yeah. Ever, was that is that right that Norway? Uh, yeah. Recruit so many uh, international students. Uh, yeah. And, uh, is, is this Erasmus and, and, and Nord Plus exchanges, are they counted in there? Yeah, those. Uh, I'm not sure about the numbers. But yeah, I mean, yeah, so they. Yeah. They share. They yeah, mm -hmm. wanted to have lots. Yeah. Okay, well, questions. Okay. okay, well, I'll be around here for another well, week. So, yes, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you.